Well, guess what, folks? The 6.5 Creedmoor is laden down with bullet flaws, and the 308 Winchester is superior, and anyone who likes the 308 should not listen to this podcast, according to one of our commenters. <laughs> but then others are commenting about what is the absolute best all-round cartridge. They're arguing that it's not the 22 long rifle like I suggested. And someone wants to know what is the cartridge that has taken the most game around the world. We're going to see if we can figure all of that out on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. <music> Hey, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching, even if someone here is going to tell you not to, because I suggested that the 6.5 Creedmoor might have some advantages over the 308 Winchester. We'll get to him in just a moment. But first, our pa our patrons. But first, our patrons. Trevor has asked me something about the 22 long rifle. Ron, I hope you are having a wonderful day. I'm a longtime listener and watcher and a brand new Patreon member. Thanks for signing up, Trevor. Really appreciate that. I was hoping to hear your thoughts on a topic that I have been thinking on for a few days now. I have been thinking on what cartridge or round has taken the most game. At first, I was thinking 22 long rifle due to how common the round is and how many rabbits and squirrels and birds and other small game have been harvested using it. But then I got on the topic of birds and shotguns came to mind with how long the 12 gauge has been around and how many different species it is used on anywhere from birds to even deer species when you use slugs and rifled barrels. So that brought me to center fire cartridges and the rabbit hole spiraled down. Then I thought of muzzle loading rifles and it continued down farther. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on which cartridge or round has been used to harvest the most game. Thank you for creating great content and passing on the wonderful knowledge that you hold. Hun honest and shoot straight. Oh, thanks for that, Trevor. This is what I wrote back to Trevor. Hello, Trevor, and thanks for your support. I much appreciate it. Hey, as for your question, I doubt if anyone really knows the answer. The 22 Rimfire has been around since about 1850, and the 12 gauge, roughly the same period. They, they both coincide with the self contained cartridges developed about that time. Now, prior to those, muzzle loaders, of course, were used for hundreds of years to take all kinds of game, but there were many fewer hunt humans who were hunting then. And while the 3030 is often credited with taking the most deer ever, I doubt anyone has hard numbers to support that. With a deer limit of one and perhaps five per year versus rabbit and squirrel limits of five to as many as 10, and jackrabbits and woodchucks, no limit at all. I don't know. Think of how many prairie dogs that are shot in a single day. I have heard from guys with lifetime tallies of woodchucks over 30,000. Now, when I keep tallies of my kills or when I did back in high school, I would sometimes amass 65 ducks and geese and 30 or 35 pheasants in a season. That's no counting on rabbits there, but uh, I only took one or two deer. So um, I don't know. We do know that the 223 Remington and the 308 Winchester are the most common ammunition sold, but much of that is burned up for plinking and target shooting. We also know that the 22 Rimfire is commonly used by poachers and by rural folk around the world to take everything and anything. And since ammo is so inexpensive and ubiquitous, I just think the 22 probably gets credit here. But I don't know for sure. Your guess is as good as mine. What do the rest of you folks think? I just don't. No, we, we always say, oh, the 3030 is taking more deer than any other cartridge, or even some say all other cartridges combined, and that just can't be possible. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of them, and a lot of deer have been taken with it, but that's just in North America primarily. So when you think worldwide, I don't know. I don't think you can ever narrow it down, but if anyone out there has hard numbers, we would sure like to hear it. But I'm sticking with the 22 long rifle. It's just been around for so long. So many people have them. Such an inexpensive round to shoot. I just think that's probably going to end up being the winner. Of course, if you go way, way back, maybe it's just uh, bows and arrows. <laughs> All right. Let's see. What's this? Hmm. 
This is someone wondering about barrel length for a 30 out six. His name is Enrico, another patron. Ron, do you think that a 51 centimeter barrel is enough for a 30 out six? That's around a 20 inch barrel, I think. I am thinking to buy a light Tika rifle in that caliber. And after your last video on new bullets and new powders, I like the idea to have just one rifle for all of my hunting and shooting. Thanks for your assistance and advice. So here's what I wrote back to Enrico. Uh, that is a bit short for taking full advantage of the 30 out 6s potential for long range performance, Enrico. But it won't hamper it much out to say about 400 yards. The 30 out 6 really does shine with a 24 inch barrel, but a 22 inch is a fair compromise. And then Enrico wrote back, well, according to what you say, since my max distance is 300, maybe 350 meters, perhaps 20 inches is a good compromise. I do need to be compact. So I wrote one final time and said, yes, if you need to be compact, a 20 inch for shooting to 300 yards will certainly suffice. You will likely lose 100 to perhaps 200 feet per second from the velocity you would have gotten from a 24 inch barrel. Now, I get asked these um, short barrel questions quite often because so many of us now are considering going with, with shorter barrels so that we can put suppressors on front and protect our hearing. And I'm certainly going that route. So to do that, of course, you're going to be adding five to seven inches of length to that thing with that suppressor out front. So it is probably smart to cut back. A lot of guys are going with 20 inch and even 18 and sometimes even 16 and a half inch barrels on their rifles. So they can put a suppressor on and keep the overall length down. But even if you just need a short barrel for woods hunting, which is one of the things that's made the lever action 3030 so popular, they generally come with 20 inch barrels. So when you get a, a larger cartridge in which you're trying to burn a lot of powder, of course, then you start to worry about, hmm, am I going to lose too much velocity here? And it's really hard to predict exactly what, with some cartridge in rifles, you might lose only 20 feet per second if you cut an inch of barrel off. But when you start cutting farther and farther down, that might increase. Um, but with others, you might not lose, well, you may lose upwards of 50 to even 75 feet per second per inch. It just depends on the powder volume and the burning rate of that powder. Now, generally, when you're throwing heavier bullets with whatever the cartridge is, the heavier the bullet for that caliber, the slower burning powder you want to use. And that would suggest you're going to probably lose some more velocity. The faster burning cart uh, powders would probably consume all of the powder in a shorter length barrel, like 16 to 18 inches. Boy, but the longer ones, you could easily go out to 26 inches, 28 inches and still be gaining velocity. But we all have to make compromises when we hunt. Not many folks are going hunting with a 26 inch barrel anymore. <laughs> Back in the muzzle loader days, we sure did. <laughs> but we got used to having a little more convenient tools. But, you know, it really doesn't matter so much these days. It's not the energy loss that's really going to cost you so much as Oh, uh, maybe you're going to get a little more wind deflection, but it used to be a concern about bullet drop. I mean, that's why they pretty much why they invented magnums back when. So you like the 30 out six, but you wanted a little more reach because you didn't know the exact distance to your target, which none of us did prior to laser rangefinders. You would get a 300 win mag. And then you'd pick up another 30 yards, maybe even 50 yards of reach before you dropped below your target. That made up for a lot of guesstimate errors on distance to target. So that was a good reason to uh, increase barrel length as well. But we uh, pretty much got used to shooting the 30 out 6 with 22-inch barrels for the convenience. Well, a very few of us were reaching out to four or 500 yards at the 30 out 6 anyway. So with the woods hunting that goes on in a 30 out 6, I think it's a great compromise at 22 inches. But if you're going to be mostly hunting, in the woods and shooting no farther than 300, maybe 350 yards or meters with laser range finders, you can now just compensate because you know the specific distance, you know the drops of your bullet. So you just either set your scope up to dial or use a ballistic reticle to aim higher or just aim over as we always did in the old days when you know your drops. And if you've got say 18 inches of drops on an 18 inch target, which is the chest of a deer, you just hold about half a deer high and you're going to drop it in the chest somewhere. 
That's worked for me for a long time. So there are ways around it. So I wouldn't fret too much. If you want to go with a shorter barrel, go for it. You're really not going to compromise much. All right. Now, let's see. What else do we have here? These are some questions that uh, my wife pulled up for me. She's liking you. Snoops through all these YouTubes to see the comments and gets a kick out of some of them. So she's come up with a few here. I have no idea what this is about. We'll see if we can figure it out. This is from someone called Don. <laughs> Please correct me, Ron. On a previous video, the 30-06, sorry, 30 ought 6 came out in 1906, thus the .06 06. Now the 308 should be in 1952. It came out, so shouldn't it be the 30.52? <laughs> I am so confused. Oh, my. <laughs> this guy's funny. What's the .08? 308 question mark? I don't know. Thanks. You're the best. At 63 in the bush all my life, why couldn't guys like you have been around when I was 20? At least I was lucky enough to get a salvaged 99C uh, for Christmas when I was 17. <laughs> Don, you're just having too much fun with this stuff. It takes a little bit of inter interpretation. Uh, folks, what, what Don is talking about, of course, are cartridge names. We cover that quite often. People wonder why things are named the way they are. And it's really all over the map. And I've often said that there's no real convention involved. You can call it pretty much anything you want, including the wrong caliber, <laughs> the wrong dose of powder that's behind it and all sorts of things. But yes, the 30 ot 6 or the 30 hyphen 06 cartridge, the military cartridge came out in 1906. And that's why we called it the 30 of 06. Or back in those days, they said ot for O or, or for zero. And that's another thing. Zeros and O's are not the same thing. So 308 Winchester is actually grammatically wrong because it's a digit. It's not a letter. It's a digit. Three, zero. It's numerical. Eight. But who's going to go around saying, oh, I'm going to grab my 308 Winchester. Just doesn't sound right, does it? So we call pretty much all of the zeros are now called O, which is a letter in the alphabet. <laughs> Uh, that's goofy. One of the many goofy things about cartridge names, and I think Don here is just kind of messing with me. And the reason he called the 308 Winchester the 30.52 is because it was released in 1952, not 1906. You could go around and around with this and come up with all kinds of great names for cartridges. <laughs> but don't please, because we're confused enough with all the ones we already have. All right, here's something else about, oh, looks like more stuff on a 308 Winchester. Oh, this is the gentleman who's not too pleased with me. This is what he says. His name is Charles. This replacement caused much death due to malfunctions and such. Not sure what that reference is, Charles. Ron, if you're going to trash the 308, here we go. <laughs> Think about the dead soldiers statistically created by replacing the flawless functioning M14, which is a modeled M1 to the Jamomatic M16 that needed several rifle mods and ammo mods. The ball powder was corrosive and jamming factor in the M16. The M16, that was a Vietnam first version of the AR-15 style, but fully automatic rifle. The M16 was long-lived and our worst performing record. The military now is replacing the 308 with 6.5 Creedmoor. That's news to me which has an effective energy killing range of 1,100 yards versus 1,500 yards for the 308. Yes, is flatter and less wind, but a lot of less killing powder and laden down with bullet flaws. Ron, you're full of it. Well, we won't tell you exactly what the it is, but I think we can figure it out. And I plead all 30 guys, mark this site, no interest. Whoo! I don't think Charles too happy with the 6.5 Creedmoor or Ron Spomer Outdoors. <laughs> but I do think, uh, Charles, you have a few things wrong here with some of your facts. First of all, bullet flaws in the 6.5 Creedmoor, I have never heard of. There are all kinds of great bullets for the 6.5. 0.264 inch diameter bullets, 264 Winchester, 6.5 300 to 26 Nosler. I mean, there's all kinds of 6.5s, 6.5 PRC now. So there are wonderful bullets out there and they are proving wonderfully effective on all kinds of game. And of course, out here in the West, we have a lot of elk cutters who use the 6.5 Creedmoor. And a young friend of mine in the area has used his. We were just talking the other day and he was telling me why he loves it so much. He's taken mule deer, whitetail, elk, 
moose. Uh, said he hasn't hunted bear yet, but he doesn't really hunt bear. But he's had great luck with all of it. And I remember one year he took a bull, it's a six by six by six bull elk from 460 yards, one shot with a six five Creedmoor. And he was using the infamously unliked by some people uh, ELD X bullet, which a lot of folks say is a horrible bullet. And yet, wonderfully effective for him. I just don't think it's fair for us to make blanket statements about how horrible some particular bullet is because maybe we had a bad experience with it. And the same with cartridges. But before you get all excited about this stuff, um, Charles, you as well, I think you do a little more research on my site and see that I'm often dismissing the 308 Winchester to stir up a little trouble just like this <laughs> and get us all talking about it and thinking about it and coming to more reasonable conclusions. Because yes, the 308, yeah, I think, is a harder hitting cartridge for, you're talking primarily about warfare here with your M M4 and uh, M1 and the M16, and M14 and all the different military uh, rifles. Um, now the the 308, of course, did not have a very long life as our service rifle, our battle rifle. Came in in 54 by the U.S. military. By 57, it was adopted by NATO under heavy pressure from the U.S. But by 1964, we'd replaced it with the M16 and the 223 for logistical reasons. And a lot of people, well, the soldiers, hated that M16. It was the, planta it was the, the plastic fantastic rifle. <laughs> and it did have a lot of issues initially, um, but they stuck with it. And uh, look what they're doing now. And they're using that 223 ever since in a lot more effective platforms or slightly tweaked ones. So it's proven itself again and again. But of course, it's still shooting that tiny little 22 caliber bullet. It's not what many would consider ideal for uh, a lot of effective punch far down range. But to say that the 6.5 Creedmoor is now replacing the 308 is not accurate. I have not heard that. I've heard that some branches of some of them, our military have accepted the 260 Remington in some surface, uh, a certain purpose rifle, special purpose, I guess. And the uh, military is now, I think, adopting the 277 Fury. Uh, they're calling it a 6.8 by something. I forgot what the digital number is on that, probably 51 millimeters. Um, that probably is going to be the new replacement for the 223, but not the Creedmoor. At any rate, Charles, I'm sorry you got upset about it all, but hey, you might want to stay tuned because coming up here real soon on Ron Spomer Outdoors, we are going to have 308 Winchester Week. If you thought Shark Week was exciting, wait till you see this one. Day after day after day after day of shooting 308 Winchester rifles. Nine different rifles on the range going head to head. And we're going to be talking all about the great 308, <laughs> if you can believe it. Let's see what Rich has to say. Hey, I have an idea for a video. What were the bullet ballistics on big game hunting in the mid to late 1800s compared to today? So you are, you are thinking, Rich, of buffalo hunters, probably. This was the era of the early centerfire brass contained cartridges, like the 4570, which came out in 1873. And then there were all kinds of them. And there were the 50 calibers and the 45s and the 40s. But, oh, man, think of the, um, like the Quigley Down Under. You've got a 5110, a 5090, a 45110, a 45120. And generally, those numbers were the the diameter of the bore or the bullet, 45 caliber, 50 caliber, and then the dose of black powder behind them, 90 grains, 45, 70 would be 45 grain bullet with 70 grains of powder and on up the scale. But what were they actually doing for ballistics? You know, you hear about these incredibly long range shots that the buffalo hunters took. And there's some documented almost to a mile in that famous Adobe Wells fight in Texas up in what's now the Texas Panhandle, where a bunch of Indians had surrounded some buffalo hunters, I believe they were, in a little sod hut kind of thing and were hammering away at them for day after day. And finally, they uh, moved off quite a ways from these buffalo rifles to plan their next approach. And one of the buffalo shooters, I think his name was Nixon, took a long, long shot and just got lucky and knocked one of them supposedly off of a horse or something. And that ended the uh, fight at Adobe Wells. <laughs> so that was an incredibly long shot. But what were the ballistics of something like a 5110? Well, most of those black powder rounds were not going any faster than around 
1,700 to maybe 2,000, 2,100 feet per second. You reach a point at which black powder just can't drive things faster than that. So, and that's one of the big reasons they came up with smokeless. They just needed an, an energy source that had more energy per grain of powder. And that proved to be a nitrocellulose and uh, to a degree, some nitroglycerin mixed in with it. Once they came up with that stuff, smokeless powder, wonderfully effective and a lot more power or energy stored inside of that chemical composition as opposed to black powder. So yeah, they were shooting rounds that just had a lot of drop and wind deflection, but they shot so much that they figured it out. So it was mostly a matter of doing at 400 and 600 yards what long range shooters today are doing at 1,000 to probably 2,000 yards. You're going to have just a heck of a rainbow trajectory way out at that distance and a lot of wind deflection. But once you figure it all out, you can get the job done. But I think it's kind of a sub point of riches here is that we get so worked up about having the latest and greatest and fastest shooting and least wind deflecting bullets and all of this great stuff. When back in the 1870s, we practically wiped out half the flora and fauna on the continent with these old fashioned rifles and black powder rounds. Fortunately, the conservation ethic took hold and we developed what we have today, which has restored almost all of our native wildlife, especially the, the hunted species, with the exception of the ones who have lost too much habitat. That is always the deciding factor. When you don't have a place to live, you cannot have the animals who live in that place. They need need a specific kind of habitat. You don't find polar bears in the south. You don't find alligators in the Arctic. <laughs> They've got to have the right habitat. And sometimes that habitat is really subtle. You know, you look at it and say, well, what's the problem? I see lots of cover out here. Well, a mule deer doesn't like the same kind of cover a whitetail necessarily does, nor an elk, nor a moose, nor a sheep, nor all the rest of them. They have their little niches that they've evolved to live in successfully. And that's what we really have to pay attention to. All right, here is someone named Charles talking about a 4082 Winchester. He says in the book, Cartridges of the World, 16th edition by Frank Barnes. That's a great book, by the way. If you want a lot of information about all the cartridges, it is in there. There's been, oh, I don't know, he's been compiling that thing for ages and ages now. Now, the newest version was edited by uh, Todd Woodward. He's been around, Todd Woodward's been around for a long time, editing lots of hunting magazines and stuff. So it says on page 205, introduced in 1885 for the Winchester single shot and also available for the model 1886 lever action Winchester. The uh, 4082 made the transition into the smokeless powder era. It was loaded until 1935. There were two loadings for a 265, oh, 260 grain bullet. That is true, Charles. Um, I didn't remember all those facts, but after I saw this from you the other day, I looked it up and it's exactly what you're saying. That old 4082, uh, I did remember that it was pretty much one of the big rounds for the 86 lever action rifle. Not nearly as popular as the 4570, but it did hang around, to my surprise, into the 1930s. So that's good information. Thanks for sharing that with us, Charles. Um, this is something about a 4082. Action is this gentleman's name. I have a correction, Ron. You said a word wrong. I don't remember what word it was, but it was definitely wrong. And that should be corrected. <laughs> I get it. Action's having some fun with us here. <laughs> I'm often correcting myself when folks point out what I did wrong. Sometimes I know I did it wrong when I'm speaking and I just keep going because it's not worth stopping and going over it again. It is fun to hear you guys correct me, but <laughs> this is pretty good one from action. I said something wrong. He doesn't know what it is, but by golly, I was wrong. So you get into the show here, action. <laughs> Thanks for that correction. It was a very subtle one. <laughs> All right, let's see what Arrow has to say about the survival rifle. I get a lot of comments about the survival rifle idea. I think it's because so many of us, not to say that we're all preppers, but we're aware of it. We're aware of the trend, and, and we do think about it from time to time. I'm no different. I'm not some crazy tre trekker who's digging holes in the ground to live in <laughs> when, the, when the stuff hits the fan. But we are as prepared as we think we can be with our own water su supply and off-grid energy sources and all the, you know, just common sense things that <clears throat> people used to do this stuff 
standard. You know, when, even when I grew up as a kid, my grandparents had wood burner in the house, even though there was electricity available. And by golly, when the electricity went out, they didn't freeze. <laughs> and they had oil lamps and lanterns left over from the old days before electricity hit the farms. So they were pretty well set. They had a big garden and a milk cow and all the rest of it. So this is the way people live for centuries and centuries. And we've kind of gotten away from that now where we push a button and everything's supposed to happen. But boy, when that chain breaks, things don't happen, kind of in trouble. And I think this is where the interest in this survival rifle comes in. If it really gets bad, what are we going to do to find some from food? We got to have a rifle to go out hunting with, right? And when the bad guys attack, we need to defend ourselves and our families. So get a lot of comments on it. And I came down saying that I thought the 22 long rifle was the, probably the ideal survival rifle because low report, you can carry Lots and lots of ammunition for it in case you have to run, you know, the old bug out bag. And there's a lot of it around. You can find it in, in drawers and houses all over. I, I don't remember a farm when I was a kid prying around in the farms and the barns and the, in the, in the, uh, the shops and even in the kitchens where if you opened the right drawer, you didn't find at least a few 22 cartridges rolling around in there. So that's why I picked a 22. But let's just see what Arrow has to say on it. What people seem to forget is the survival rifle debate is that a bow is even more versatile and lighter than a 22 long rifle and has basically infinite ammo as long as you know how to make it. That is an excellent point, Arrow. I thought of that when I was I'm saying this in whatever show I did it, <clears throat> but I thought, well, this is about cartridges and rifles, so I'm really not going to bring up the bow and arrow thing. But you're absolutely right, because eventually you're going to run out of ammunition. And with a bow, you can make ammunition a lot more easily than you can with a rifle. <clears throat> for this reason, I would use a bow for small game hunting and choose a high-powered centerfire rifle, any, any caliber I could get my hands on, as my secondary weapon. The rifle would allow me to make use of shot opportunities that I would be missing out on with the 22 shotgun or bow. And it would also be much better at self-defense against both humans and wildlife than a 22 or a bow. Ah, about on par with a shotgun. Yeah, those are some great points, Arrow. Um, I think if we really had to survive um, in, in a primitive fashion, you've got to think back and recognize the incredible abilities of Stone Age cultures. People who could survive not just in the jungle, but think of up in the Arctic, native peoples living in under those conditions. It's dark almost, what, three months of the year, they don't see the sun and they're living under blocks of ice that they've cut and surviving without electricity, without running water, without a heat source of any kind. It's amazing what they do. So I, I just think the ability to live off the land is a lost art, but obviously humans can do it We've got the smarts. It's just that we think we're superior now because of our high technology that we let, kind of laugh at the old primitive people, but think of what they were doing to keep alive and not just alive, but increasing in numbers and slowly evolving and developing to what we've become now dependent on technology. <laughs> in some ways, it's not so good. Something to think about. <clears throat> All right. What do we have here? Another correction, I screwed up again. <laughs> this is Rod. Hey, Ron, your card mentioned 4440, my card. Not sure what that is. But, but then there's a 3840, but it's a 40 caliber, just the opposite. There's also a match cartridge, 19th century 4062, that was popular and flat for the time. Yeah, a little bit of difficulty interpreting his abbreviations and such here. So I did something about the 4440 and I mentioned the 3840 and I probably said it was a 38 caliber. He's telling me that's really a 40 caliber and he's right. I remember now it is a 40, one of those misnamed deals again. Um, but there was there were at least two 3840s. There was a 3840 Winchester, which was the 4440 neck down, but the 40 caliber. They used a 0 .401 inch diameter bullet, if I remember, uh, not 38, which is really weird. But then the uh, Remington version called the 3840 Remington. And I think then there were a hyphen Hepburn using a single shot target rifle. It was a longer cartridge, a little bit faster. And that one used a 0 .375 or 0 .372 inch diameter bullet, closer to 38. Again, Confusion with the naming and the nomenclature of these cartridges. 
Um, but yeah, Rod here looks like you're pretty much spot on from what I remember now that you're, you're saying it. The 4062, I don't remember that one. But I do remember the number. I think that was also offered in the 1886 or the 76 Winchester. Maybe it came out for the 76 Winchester lever action rifle, which was the 1873 4440 beefed up to take a little bit bigger cartridges. It was the 86 Winchester that really modernized it. A Browning design, <coughs> a Browning design that really was much stronger than the old toggle length system in the lever action rifles back then. Um, and then they got into, uh, gosh, guys, if you look up in that um, Cartridges of the World book we mentioned earlier by Frank C. Barnes, you look in there and you will be amazed at all the old black powder cartridges and their numbers like this. 38, 40, 38, 45, 38, this and that, 40, this and that. On and on it goes. They would just lengthen the case, add more powder, give it another number. If you thought or if you think we have too many cartridges today, Go back and look at what they were putting out in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. It was crazy. All right. Mo Man. Mo Man is uh, saying something about a guy that I quoted uh, who had never gone hunting. Mo Man says, like this guy who never went hunting, I have wished I could go hunting more often. But after dad passed away and a lack of access to private land, I've quit. I'd go alone, but public land in the southeast is crowded with jerks who respect nothing, others, the land, the game, or even parking. Oh, boy. Mo Man is having a bad time out there. I think this is in response to a letter we got, a comment we got from a young man back in the, oh, so it was like Illinois or Indiana or someplace, who said he did not have trouble finding good places to hunt on public land. He just didn't go on the opener of the deer season. He said in the off season, what? most people would consider an off season because it's just small game hunting for squirrels and rabbits and stuff. He said he could get out and not find anybody else out there on those public areas when he was hunting and he was having a great time. So Mo Man here is probably not <laughs> agreeing with it. So it sounds like he's got crowded conditions where he is. Mo Man, all I can tell you and anyone else listening is if you're serious about hunting and getting out, enjoying the whole experience, is is to keep trying. It is worth it because this is our heritage, uh, nature and interacting with it one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're out getting mushrooms or acorns or fruits and berries or rabbits or deer or whatever you're harvesting from nature. <clears throat> you have the right to do that. Obviously, we have to follow state laws, which are designed to provide access for everyone and not let someone hog it all. That's why we have tags and bag limits and season dates and all that stuff. That's all good conservation. And we should applaud ourselves for starting that because it's the hunters who began that whole process. When we saw the the dangers of market hunting and unrestricted access, we realized you've got to control things when you have so many people and ever fewer places for animals to survive and thrive. But once you've got that figured out and you start researching and striving to find places, it's definitely worth it. And especially if you can cultivate a landowner, you find a farmer or rancher who farms with some wildlife in mind. It's not just a blanket production operation, but they've got some woodlots or some brushy corners and some ponds with some cattails around them. A few places for wildlife and you get permission to hunt on something like that, you can really enjoy yourself. Mix that in with a little bit of the public land and you can have a great time. So I wouldn't give up. I can certainly understand that I have been out on some hunts where there was just a little too much activity from two-legged predators <clears throat> that kind of ruined the fun for everybody. <clears throat> but, but I persist. I keep at it. And eventually I find empty places and uh, especially middle of the week or there's just different ways to go about it. Um, be a little bit creative and I think you're going to do just fine. Now, here are our comments just pulled up from the guys. I think Silas probably grabbed these for me. This is from Alabama. Richard, if you have firearms that are shooting well, would you bed them in free float barrels if you're going to a much different climate? I'm planning an African hunt to include buffalo 
Good point, Richard. So the idea with bedding your rifle, whether you full length glass bed it to stiffen the barrel with the stock or float the barrel, meaning sanding the stock out so it doesn't touch the barrel anywhere, you get better accuracy with one or the other. You just have to play around with it. But if you've got a rifle from the factory and it shoots quite well where you are, and then you go to a really humid climate or a really dry climate, and if you've got a walnut stock especially, are you afraid that that's going to warp enough to change the impact, the different pressure on the barrel from the stock and that sort of thing? Possibly, possibly. I don't know, though, that I would automatically either bed or float it if it shoots well for me at home. I think I would try to replicate the conditions where you're going to be. Africa is not one giant, hot, humid place. It's a huge continent. I think you can stick something like two or three of the United States landmass inside of Africa and have some room left over. It's just unbelievably big. And it goes everywhere from hot, dry deserts to hot jungles to cold, snowy mountaintops. So you don't really know what you might come up against. I have gone over many times with many different rifles many of them with walnut stocks, not had any problems with serious shifts in impact and whatnot. Obviously, you check your zero when you get there, but I don't think I would recommend making that switch. Um, of course, the easy answer is to use a uh, synthetic stock that doesn't have any of that issue with swelling and shifting and such. But make sure it's a good stiff one. Some of the molded ones that they just cast in a mold are a little bit flexible and they can get a little bit soft in the heat, in the sun, and maybe touch the barrel and change your impacts there. But what you want to do at home, I think, is maybe put that thing in the freezer and get it really, really cold or take it out in the winter and try it. Uh, and then on some really humid days, see if it's changing. But if it's been consistent over the course of a year or several years under varying conditions, I think you're going to be all right. All right, Jordan from Vermont, can you talk about 300 Hammer sometime? I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Now, I'm not sure if you mean Hammer for sure. Um, he's got it abbreviated H-A-M apostrophe S, which means Ham owns something. So that's, I'm going to guess it's a 300 Hammer. Hmm. At any rate, he'd love to hear my thoughts on it and its future, especially considering that it was just SAMI approved. Oh, I didn't know that it was SAMI approved, but thanks for that information, Jordan. I don't know all that much about it, um, but it's one of these short cartridges that throws heavy bullets. And if you like that, a lot of guys use, use them for hogs. I think they were kind of created for um, relatively quiet action for the military, for the special operations groups when they need a heavy bullet to get some really good penetration, but not a lot of recoil and keeping things quiet with the suppressor on front. So they're shooting under a thousand or right at about a thousand feet per second with a big heavy bullet. I don't know that you need that for hunting unless you are trying to take out a sounder of feral pigs. Um, and then I think it's probably going to work pretty well. But it's real popular in the, obviously, short action cartridge style rifles like the AR-15s. And that's, I think, the big reason that it was created. So if you like an AR-15 and you're looking for something that'll throw a heavier bullet, certainly take a look at that one. It'll be a good one. That's about all I know. But I just, I haven't played around with it and really not that up on it. All right. Now we're going to West Virginia. Boy, we are staying east here. Tim, Tim asking about fire, something about firearms. I have a Model 70 Winchester. Oh, you don't have it. He's got it on order. Oh, this doesn't look so good. I have a Winchester Model 70 that has been ordered since January of 22. I called yesterday and was told that it would not be available until the last of 2024. Well, it's getting closer. <laughs> What is Winchester's problem? Oh, boy. I think you're asking the wrong person here. I'm not Mr. Winchester. Why can we still not get nozzle partition bullets? I'm getting a poor response from them. And why can we not find large rifle magnum primers? This is getting depressing, Wes. Oh, this is Tim, not Wes. Oh, now this is to the point and none of it is funny. Sorry, I'll be serious. <clears throat> if I had not had reloads for my firearms the last year, my hunting season would have been a bust. I couldn't find any ammunition to buy off shelf. I shoot a 30 at 6, 180 grain nozzle partition, a 375 H&H &H Magnum with a 260 grain nozzle partition, and last, a 348, ooh, that's unusual, with a 250 grain burger bullet. 
And he, gosh, he can't find any ammo. He can't find any primers. He can't even get a new rifle. Welcome to the new world post COVID. It is a mess, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's another reason to be a prepper, I think, and get prepared, guys. Look, who saw this coming, right? I mean, we've had our, okay, primers were a little bit scarce for a while there. Ammo prices went up and down. For a while there, you couldn't get 22 long rifle because everybody was hoarding them. There's all these scare things that come through, and then it straightens out again. But boy, lately, it's not seeming to straighten out again. I've been waiting for a long time for some primers to pop up. I'm still limping along with my old supply. So I hear you, Tim, in, and I don't have the answers. I did an interview with the folks at Hodgden Powder, and they said that their powder supplies are good. They get some from overseas from a few suppliers, but most of it is made here, and the supply chain seems to be delivering it, and they are up to speed at getting it out to the various distributors. But what happens to it after that, I don't know. Is someone hoarding it? I do know that all of these military operations around the world now are going to put a big hurt on the supply. Because when the military says, we need a few million more rounds of this, that, and the other thing, guess who's getting it first? Those are huge orders and these ammo companies bid for it. And when they get the bid, they've got to crank that ammo out we recreational shooters kind of get pushed to the back. And I think that's mainly what's happening with all our supplies, especially primers. Um, as for Nosler, perhaps they got a, an assignment to produce bullets for the military and they're using all of what they've got to crank those out. I just don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to snoop around. What most of the guys around here do is they just keep tabs in all of the gun shops. They stop in like once a week or twice a week. And a few times, some of the owners of the smaller places will set aside one box for each person or something. But they they will often, of course, say, limit two boxes of primers per customer because they want to keep everyone happy. Um, and maybe the same with cartridges, one box of 270 or 30 or whatever you need. So I don't know what to tell you, but I, I hope more companies begin manufacturing more. I know Fioki is starting up they may already be cranking them out, a primer facility, a new primer building facility. And I heard there's one other one. I don't remember the name of it. So I think folks are stepping up. But again, that's another one of our problems in this country is we spent how many decades shifting all of our production overseas because it was cheaper. Stupid idea, I'm afraid. At any rate, I just can't help you there, Tim. I'm sorry. I wish I could. I do say this, for, um, knowing what I know about Model 70s and how much I love them, <laughs> it's probably worth waiting for. <laughs> if they make them as well as I used to, the, the last few that I tried were, were really pretty good. So good luck finding that, not just to Tim, but to everyone out there. It's just really unfortunate that we're in this, this current situation. But hey, you know, we're, we're finding that we can't find all sorts of materials that used to be widely available. You go, go to get a part for your truck or a freezer for the kitchen or something, and there's nothing there. All right, from Arizona, Christopher, which would be better to hunt, moose or caribou with a 7 millimeter 8 with 150 grain Barnes TTSX at 2,715 feet per second or a 162 grain Hornady ELDX at 2,640 feet per second? Well, I don't think the moose or caribou are going to like either one of these options. Personally, I would go for the 150 grain Barnes TTSX. I have taken caribou with a 7 millimeter 08. I've taken moose with uh, 280 AI and 150 grain TTSX. Oh, no, that was just a straight X bullet back in those days. Um, I have not used the ELDX that often on game. I do know that it's Basically a cup and core bullet, but it's got a little bit more jacket stuck to the lead via a ring, kind of like the interlock, if I remember right. I haven't sectioned and looked at one of those, but I'm pretty sure that they've got that interlocking ring as part of the operation. But you can figure that that bullet is going to be a more traditional shoot them broadside behind the shoulder in the the lungs bullet for top performance. Whereas the Barnes, obviously that copper bullet is famous for staying in one piece. Uh, retaining 90 to 100% of its weight. And because of that, you've got incredible penetration. Um, so you can take a shoulder shot or a quartering shot and trust that bullet to go a little deeper. But either one of them is going to have plenty of energy to do the job. The bullet just needs to have enough energy to get through the tissues to reach the vitals, do the hemorrhaging, and there you go. 
But my pick would be the the Barnes TTSX. Oh, hey, here's a, a guy named Christopher from Arizona, just like the last one. What is the last one? <laughs> Regarding my previous question, okay. Um, on my 708 hunting rifle, the twist is one in, in eight and a half inches. Wow, that's a fast twist rate. Yeah, no problem with either of those. You, gosh, you could go with a 180 grain bullet with that um, if you wanted to. I don't really think you need to, but yeah. You got to remember the 757 Mauser was just about the speed of a 708 Remington. And that one has been used to take all kinds of buffalo in Africa and big game of all, all sorts way back when. And that used, they were using 173 grain bullets back then on that one. So yeah, you can run with those heavier bullets if you'd like. But with that uh, 150 grain Barnes TTSX, you're going to get plenty of penetration. All right, uh, well, we're going to skip, uh, you know, get away from Christopher now, and we're going to go to South Texas, and Robert asks us about hand-loading something. As a hand-loader, I've enjoyed two forgotten cartridges, the 358 Winchester, that's a great one, and the 280 Remington. Anything in North America can be hunted with these two cartridges. What do you think? You sold me. <laughs> I agree. I, I haven't done a lot with the 358 Winchester. Did some uh, feral pig hunting in Texas with it and some coyote hunting was really impressed with the uh, impact on those guys. That is a 308 Winchester necked up to 35 caliber. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's a great round. I'd use it for moose, elk, or just about anything. And uh, I did take it up into the wilderness in British Columbia one time, but I didn't use it. I had two barrels on a switch barrel rifle. It was called the Kifaru, kind of a custom setup, really lightweight, like less than Gosh, I think it was four and a half pounds, maybe even a little lighter than that. Crazy light, well-controlled recoil, wonderful and accurate. But you could swap barrels from a 708 to a 358. You just took two barrels along, figured I'd shoot the moose with the 358. Well, I took a mountain goat and caribou with a 708. Didn't get a crack at a moose with it, so didn't get the chance to shoot that 358. But I think you'll do well with it. 200 grain, 225 grain bullet. You could even shoot a 250 in it. Getting a little slow there, but for close range work should be great. Now the 280 Remington, of course, that thing never really did take off, but it is a great round. It falls right in between the performance of the 270 Winchester and a 30 out six. You can shoot your pretty heavy bullets in it. I would probably roll with the 150 all copper of some kind, like the home, say the, the Barnes, which you've already mentioned. And, uh, cutting edge. It's got some great bullets. And I've really been having great luck recent years with the hammer hunter bullets. Great copper bullet. Load one of those up in 140, 150 grain. You should be just fine. But again, the, with the 28, you can go these days up to 180 grain bullets in them if you've got the twist rate to stabilize it. But those are, as you say, a couple of great cartridges that you can use to hunt anything in North America. Use the right bullet, put it in the right place. You've got them. Good job, Robert. And that looks like the end of our questions. Wow. Yeah, that got a little confusing a few times there. Um, it, it helps if I read stuff ahead of time because there's often abbreviations and misspellings and I kind of stumble over those. But I think we got to the heart of the matter on some of these. Thanks for some of the humor, guys. That was some good effect. And thanks for the corrections when I needed them. The additional information on the 3840 Winchester was handy. And a little more news on that 4062, was it? Or it was 4080? I can't remember. It's too many of them out there, guys. But check out that book, Cartridges of the World. If you really want to become an expert on cartridges, they're all in there, including the Brits and the uh, Europeans and just all kinds of them. So until next time, we're going to find some more questions, get some more Patreon questions coming in. If you guys would like to have your questions answered anytime and every time, join Patreon and you get to uh, knock on my door <laughs> via the computer anytime you'd like. And I will try to do my best to answer your questions well, effectively, <laughs> honestly, and quickly. <laughs> and hope I get those right. But always, always, thanks for straightening me out on anything I get wrong, guys. We are all in this together. Thanks for your help. And thanks for being a conservation hunter who makes it possible for all of us to enjoy our deer hunting, our bird hunting, and all the wonderful things we get to do. Until next time, hunt honest and shoot straight.